episode 16, Einstein's right again. Welcome back to another episode of Syzygy, episode 16. I'm amazed we're up to episode 16. It's just all going so quickly. This time around, we're talking about the supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy and how observations of stars going around it have proved, once again, when's it going to be conclusive that Albert Einstein was right in his theory of no. Not his theory of general relativity, his general theory of relativity. Let's get that right off the bat. Joining me at the microphone, as ever, Dr. Emily Brunston. Hello, hello. So before we get on to Albert and his theories and really cool stuff involving black holes and the centres of galaxies, bit of a test update. Yes, yes. What's going on? Well, I woke up this morning to some exciting news, and that is that uh, NASA have released the um, full coordinates for where TESS is currently pointing. So TESS started science observations last Friday. Fantastic. So just about a week ago, and we now know exactly where it's pointing. So all of us astronomers who are keen to get our special stars uh, observed are now madly having a look and seeing, uh, putting all the coordinates together, doing some interesting um, coordinate math and geometry. Yes, when I arrived here not long ago, Emily was looking a little bit perturbed because it wasn't. it's not just a matter of, hey, Tess is pointing in this direction, go and have a look. It's, here's a bunch of numbers figure out what they mean to figure out where we're looking at. And that's <laughs> non-trivial. Yeah, we have different coordinate systems in astronomy and you, the spacecraft don't always use the same ones as what the astronomers would like them to use. Yeah, funny that. I mean, it, you know, it'd be nice and simple if everyone spoke the same numeric language, but apparently that's just a bit too difficult. Yeah, well, it's different different reasons. So, um, for example, TESS uses coordinates that are based around the solar system because it's going around the, uh, the Earth and the Moon, and that's kind of useful. Whereas astronomers tend to use coordinate systems that go with the celestial equator and the celestial poles, which are these points that don't rotate with the Earth's rotation. So it's not quite the same as saying, here's my GPS coordinates, I'll meet you over here, and we'll go and find lunch. It's it's somewhat more complicated than that. There's a little bit of maths. Yeah, there's a bit of maths. Oh, well, we'll, the the little satellite that could is up there going to be taking some data. When are you actually going to get data to play with? We're hoping for December at the moment for DR1, which is data release one. Not far away. It's going to be a really good Christmas present. Excellent. Well, more test updates as they come along. Uh, and I'm sure out there in our in our listenership, the test fan club is growing. We should probably set up a separate website for that entirely for uh, for just test related news. In other news, which isn't related to tests, but is nonetheless monumentally awesome. So Albert Einstein's right again. I mean, has he ever really been in doubt Not so much, but it's really nice every once in a while to come up with a new way of testing the theories of the great scientists from 100 years ago. And the one which has just been hitting the papers recently, hitting the news recently, is a really, really good one because it's some data over the last, well, decade or more, a couple of decades, of stars orbiting the massive black hole at the center of the Milky Way galaxy. And if that doesn't make you sit up Open your eyes wide and take notice. I don't know what with what will. So, Emily, talk us through this one. What's going on? So, this is really exciting because this is the first time that we've been able to test general relativity and observe its effects in such an intense gravitational field. So, we we know quite a bit about general relativity. It's these very very small corrections we have to make to our theory of gravity to make things kind of all work. And when we talk about small mass things, so people apples dropping from trees, for example, Newton's uh, gravity, then it's just not a very large effect. But we have observed it in sort of quite small systems uh, around the Earth and the planets and so on. But we wanted to try it out in something a bit bigger, something with a bit more mass. So something with something like four million times the mass of the sun kind of mass. Yeah, you're going to start seeing something interesting at that point. You're getting up into properly relativistic regimes then, aren't you? That's fun. Yeah. And of course, the most massive thing that we have in our entire galaxy is the supermassive black hole at the centre. Yes, I mean, I guess if you can't use the entire galaxy itself, then you've got to go for something which is pretty big within that galaxy. And this is this is the biggest thing we've got. Yeah. Right, yeah. right at the heart, there is a supermassive black hole. How big is it? Four million times the mass of the sun. Good Lord. I mean, that's that's 
extraordinarily big. Rather big. But when you say big, I mean, there are different different kinds of big. There is big in terms of mass and there's big in terms of actual physical size. And black holes are really interesting because they can be incredibly massive and yet comparably very small. So this is how many, it's like several billion solar masses. Yep. But how big does that translate to in terms of actual size? Yeah, so black holes are interesting when you talk about how big they are. Of course, they have gravitational effects which go out for very, very large distances. But the way we sort of define the size of a black hole is something called the Schwarzschild radius. And that's kind of like the edge, if you like. If you go beyond that, then you're totally stuffed in terms of the black hole. That's the, that's the go no further boundary. Yeah, it's the event yeah. horizon. It's this place where even if you could travel as fast as the speed of light, then you couldn't escape from this black hole. Okay. You're doomed. So do any any idea of how big the event horizon for a supermassive black hole at the centre of our galaxy is? So this one is um, 0.08 times the distance between Earth and the Sun. So just a bit less than 10% the distance between Earth and the Sun. Right. So that's that's tiny yeah. for something which is millions of solar masses. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? Millions of suns squeezed into yeah. such a tiny space. Yeah. Now, of course, for, for anything in the area, you know, as long as you're not getting too close, anything in the area just simply sees that as an incredibly massive object with a very strong gravitational field. So I'm just going to go orbit around that. The fact that it's a black hole, if you get far enough away, makes absolutely no difference at all, except for a couple of things. And one of those things is that it's a black hole. You can't see it. Yeah, this is the tricky thing when we come to a trying to observe the black hole at the centre of the galaxy. How do you observe something that, by definition, sucks in all light? Yeah. So really interesting thing about making observations of the centre of the galaxy is that you can't see the thing itself. What you're looking for is its effects on the stuff around it. And so that's what makes this story so interesting. So let's back up a little bit. Who's Who's been doing this? Where, where is the research? Who's done it? And big thumbs up to them. Yeah. So this is um, something called the Gravity Collaboration, which is a really nice... Well done. I think it's an acronym, but mm -hmm. I don't remember what all the bits stand for. Tips for new players in science. You've got to come up with a good acronym for your science. It helps you to get just that extra 10% funding. It's usually... That, that funding is usually attached to acronym status. So having gravity research called gravity gets you surely at least 10%, maybe 15% on your funding grant. Yeah, yeah, it's a good start. Um, so this is a collaboration of actually a huge bunch of international scientists. It's led by a few European institutions, including the Max Planck Institute, um, Grenoble, and uh, ESO as well, the European Southern Observatory. Uh, so they were looking at using the um, Very Large Telescope, which is again a wonderful acronym of VLT, <laughs> Yes, as the telescopes are getting larger and larger, we're working on we're working on these acronyms. And yeah. you know, there's the very large telescope. There's the is there the stupidly large telescope? I mean, we had, the we had a plan for large, an overwhelming large overwhelming you was something owl. Like that. <laughs> overwhelmingly large. Unfortunately, telescope. they got scrapped. Maybe because of the name. We yeah, don't. yeah. But this is the one that's up on the mountains, the the desert mountains in Chile. Isn't yes, it, it is. Yeah, yeah. And so the interesting thing about the observations is that actually we can't use a traditional uh, observation method for the centre of our galaxy. You can't get out the kind of optical telescope that you could look through and go and see what's going on at the start there. Why, why is that? There's just too much stuff in the oh, way. Oh, right, right. Yeah, because when you look to the centre of the galaxy, I mean, a galaxy is filled with an enormous number of stars. And so as you look at the Milky Way, you're seeing, you know, through an extraordinary number of stars. And if you go and look at, at, at proper telescope images of, of the galactic plane, then there are just ludicrous numbers of stars that show up that we don't even see from down here with our, with our incredibly coarse eyes. Um, but there's more than that, isn't there? Yes, there's, it's much, much worse than that. Yeah. We've also got gas and dust. So if you go out and see the Milky Way, you might be able to see these black smudges all through the plane of the Milky Way, especially towards the centre. Or in the Southern Hemisphere, the Colsac Nebula is an example of this. It's quite famous. Right. And those aren't voids. That's not sort of, oh, there's no stars in that bit. That's... Dust That's getting in dust the way. Dust getting in the way. Yeah. Which does make looking for stuff in the middle of the in the middle of the galaxy quite challenging because you're looking through like we're sort of what, halfway out to the edge of the galaxy, something like that? You're looking through 
a large amount of the galaxy to try to see the very centre of the galaxy. At first blush, I would have thought, surely that's impossible. You can't do it. So they obviously are. How? So, well, we don't use the optical light because it's right. just not getting to us from the center. Okay. So instead we use radio techniques and we use interferometry as well. So what we do is we, um, well, between infrared and radio, we can put together some of these pieces. So actually for the gravity collaboration, they were using um, an interferometer on these VLTs. So that was uh, using some light, actually a little bit towards the infrared part of the spectrum. And uh, by combining the signals that you're getting from these different telescopes, you can improve the resolution that you're seeing. It's a little bit of a trick we have in interferometry, where if you have two observations taken at a particular distance apart, if you combine them in a very clever way, you can effectively achieve an observation as if you had a, um, a telescope that was the size of the distance between those two. It's very clever, isn't it? It's if, really clever. I mean, if you look at the layout of the, the very large telescope up there on the top of the mountains in Chile, um, it is these, these enormous telescope domes. I mean, it's quite an amazing looking place. But there's four of them yep. spread out over a distance. And I was, I was reading up on it when this story came up. It, it's really interesting that, you know, when you, when you apply for observing time on the on the big telescope you can use one of those you can get a couple of them hooked up in this in this interferometry way and, and make a bigger telescope typically they'll go for three for really big projects this one they said no we're going all out we're going to use <laughs> all, all four, four of them <laughs> yep. and then there's another eight telescopes smaller domes around the place which can move which add in information as well um, and for for this one to see into the heart of the galaxy they had pretty much everything going which is just extraordinary yeah. and they ended up producing images as if they were using a telescope which was the size of the entire facility which is extraordinary yeah no, amazing and even the the four big telescopes are some of the biggest telescopes in the world they're each eight meters in diameter of the size of the mirrors so these are these yeah. are not you know little yeah. pieces huge of equipment. huge things yeah, huge, huge things we'll put some links in the show notes yeah. and go and have a look at this facility because it is i'd love to go there one day oh yeah absolutely love to go there i mean it's not easy to get to it is up on top of mountains in the deserts of chile it's intentionally a long way away from everything else but i'd still love to go there one day that would be cool and this is speaking of that um that interferometry that's the same kind of technology behind some of the big new telescopes that are coming online like the square kilometer array aren't they definitely yeah. the, with the ska which is spread over large parts of the australian outback desert in western australia as well as south africa and there's a couple in New Zealand as well. And there there's one in New Zealand. One, yep. one, one <laughs> bit over there in New Zealand. One. But the whole point is that if you have all of these relatively small dishes spread out in particular patterns over, let's call it most of the Earth, most of the Southern Hemisphere, you end up getting the equivalent of a telescope which is an entire square kilometer in size, which is huge. It's, Absolutely yeah. huge. Yeah. So very, very clever stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And that's in radio. So that's even more exciting because we're looking for usually very high energy things in the radio part of the spectrum. Okay. So coming back to this particular one, then we've got this amazing, very large telescope and they're pulling out all the stops to say, let's just ramp this thing up to 11, peering at the center of the Milky Way, peering through the dust because so you said that they're not looking in the visible they're looking in the infrared and radio i think there were some radio observations right. as well but most well the VL, the vlt ones are in this yeah, particular part of the infrared but the point of that being that the, the visible light is blocked by the dust it can't get through but other wavelengths can Yes. It's transparent yeah. to the infrared. Yeah, or radio. at least less blocking. Yeah. I mean, these things are still incredibly faint, which is why you need this really eight meter size telescopes to just get enough photons coming from this part of the galaxy. So it's not, it's really not an easy uh, it, thing to yeah, do. No, no. And that's borne out in the fact that it's taken a couple of decades of observation to actually get the results that have come through in this paper. So when you do go and look, at the heart of the galaxy. You manage to get through all that dust. You manage to not have a bloody great star right in your field of view that you can't see past. It's, it's great. What do you see? 
What do you see, what is at the heart of the galaxy? Well, we can't see the black hole directly. It's just got no light that it can put out. But I mean, generally, the the, the region at the heart of the galaxy. Like when you see a picture of a galaxy, your classic um, spiral galaxy, which the the Milky Way is, right? You've got all these these spiral arms which are filled with stars and and dust and gas, and they're all bright. And and at the centre, there's this really really bright bit. And I think Super I always bright, yeah. imagined in my mind's eye that the centre of the galaxy is so just filled with stars and gas that even if you could get a view through to the middle, you'd just see brightness. You know, it'd just be, <laughs> it'd just be basically just one big ball of bright. Apparently I'm wrong about that. So what does it look like? So well, you're right, there are lots more stars in the centre of our galaxy. It's actually a part of the galaxy we call the um, the bulge, right in the centre. And so the density of stars increases quite dramatically when you get there. And the closer you get in, sort of that density of the bulge tends to increase. But then if we go right in really close to the, to the black hole at the centre, then we do find that there's a few stars that are orbiting the centre of the galaxy in quite a wonderful way and we saw this uh, for the first time um, about 20 years ago when we started to be able to get enough um, data from this part of the galaxy to, to see what those individual stars were doing and for the last 10 years or so I've had in my lecture series when we talk about the black hole at the center of the galaxy I've had this wonderful video that I've been showing um, which shows this um, there's a particular star going around the center of the black hole or this, uh, going around the black hole at the center and it sort of whizzes past on this wonderfully elliptical orbit and um, you really see it speed up as it gets really close, and then it sort of slows down and meanders around as it goes further away. Right. It's it's doing this this great sort of elliptical orbit, which is, you know, it's the same kind of orbit, mostly, as, you know, the Earth going around the sun and the other planet and the moon going around the Earth. The fabulous thing about this, I've seen the same video, it's, it's really, really interesting, is that stars don't typically go that fast you know <laughs> that the sun is moving through the galaxy is moving around the center everything is moving around everything is in motion but you don't normally see it kind of on this scale you know we, we talk about the fixed stars in the night sky they're not fixed they are moving just incredibly slowly to the point where it took thousands of years for anyone to even notice that they that they were moving at all but these ones these ones are, are, are whipping around to the point where this one star, we now have, what, more than one complete orbit within 20 or so years, which for a star is staggeringly fast. It's At its fastest, it was measured at going something like, what was it, like a couple of tenths of the speed of light? Yeah, 3% of the speed of light. Or 3% of the speed of light, which yeah. is, for a star... Like normally in particle accelerators, we're talking getting protons up to a small fraction of the speed of light or electrons or something like that. That's that's pretty cool. But those are particles. This is an entire star moving at these speeds. It's got to be going around something really big and heavy. And yet the fabulous thing is you look right there at, at the middle of its orbit or at the focal point of its orbit and there's nothing there. There's nothing there. Nothing there. Now there is. There is something there. <laughs> we just can't see it. Supermassive yeah. black hole, several million suns worth. Wow. And we do have some signatures from the black hole in other parts of the spectrum as well. So we've detected X-rays from it. In fact, it's where the, the black hole um, got its name from. So it's called Sagittarius A star, which uh, was a designation from when we started doing um, high energy surveys of the galaxy. And we were like, oh, that's a, that's a bright thing in our X-rays and gamma rays. I wonder what that is. Well, it's in Sagittarius, so we'll call it Sagittarius, call it Sagittarius. Makes A sense. star. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then yeah, later on, we can follow it up and actually find out that that's that's that signature is, is coming from the black hole yes of course because as we've discussed i think before on this podcast black holes are well they are dark but they're not completely dark and when stuff does fall into a black hole it does sort of spiral in and cross over that um that boundary really interesting stuff happens along the way and very high energy stuff and so it ends up spitting out huge amounts of very high energy photons and other particles x-rays so if you look at it with the right kind of instruments you can see it very bright indeed um but when you look at it in the visible in the infrared there's nothing there yeah 
So th- these are the kind of pieces of evidence we have that fact that black holes exist because we have no other theory that we can construct for an object to be so massive and to have such an interesting radio signature and uh, X-ray signature and have be in within this orbit of this really, really fast-going star. Yeah, I mean, and, and for this particular study, that's the thing, is that there's there's nothing else that we can come up with that would cause this star and others nearby, but the, this one particular star, which I think was called S2. S2, it's, um, yeah, the most simple name yeah. of a star I think we have talked about on this podcast. It's great. Um, there's nothing else that could cause it to do what it's doing. Now, when you look at this this little video, when you look at the images, you can see the star going around in what is pretty much an elliptical orbit. And as I said before, you know, this was solved for Newtonian gravity centuries ago, right? We call them Keplerian orbits, and, and there are various of, of Kepler's laws that, that talk about how quickly a planet or something goes around the sun and what kind of shape the orbit is and how you know how fast it's going and, and equal areas over equal times and, and all of that sort of stuff that you learn about in school. But it's all based on Newtonian gravity. And Newton's law of gravity, hundreds of years old, is actually really good. You know, it describes low energy, low mass stuff really, really well. Um, and it's a very simple theory. It's a theory that says if you've got a mass here, and a mass there, then the force of gravity between them depends on those two masses and and the distance between them. Actually, it's one over the distance squared. But anyway, it's a fairly simple and really useful physical law. It works. Einstein came along about 100 years ago and said, yeah, look, it's not so simple. It's actually a bit more complicated than that. And his general theory of relativity said, If you have a large amount of mass or a large amount of energy, same thing, basically, then that's going to warp space-time around it. And what that means is that the force of gravity comes out of that as, well, if space-time is is bent, then things traveling through space-time are going to follow curved paths in the same way that I think, Emily, we, when we, last time we were talking about this, you raised the idea of having a bowling ball on a, on a bed sheet or putting a bowling ball on your bed and it curves the bed sheet down and then you could roll a marble past it and it'll curve around as it goes around. That's pretty much exactly what we think the Earth is doing as it's going around the sun. It's rolling around the curved space-time. Einstein's theory puts relatively small corrections for most cases on Newton's theory. And that's what we were testing here with the star going around this this supermassive black hole in the center of the galaxy. Suddenly we've got, hang on, that's a star moving really quickly around something incredibly heavy. Quick, someone get Albert on the phone. We can test this. That's what they were doing, isn't it? Yes, yeah. And what's really cool is that you can test this idea of having uh, what we call a gravitational well, or if you like, that's the the curvature of the space-time. Because we know that uh, with photons and light travels at the set speed. In fact, this is where Einstein started off all his um, theories of both special and then general relativity. So we, we, have a, we have a speed that light travels at, and light has to travel at that speed all the time. It's got no option so long as it's in the vacuum of space. That's it. That's the rule. That's the law. That how yep. it goes. Yeah. And so when we see light uh, changing, if it's going to have to change energy, then the only way that light can change energy is to change its wavelength. So that means it's sort of a ch- it's changing its color. So if it wants to lose some energy, then it will head to have longer wavelengths, which makes it more red, towards the red end of the spectrum, and vice versa for giving blue. And I think we've talked about before how you can use this to measure changes in speed of objects because they sort of crunch up the wavelengths or stretch them out. Now what's really interesting about this gravitational well is that to for the photon to escape, basically, from near this black hole, it's got to climb out of this well. It's kind of like climbing out of a valley. And to do that, it's losing energy. Which means, from what you just said, it's going to be changing colour. Yes. And if it's losing energy, it's becoming redder. Yes. So this effect is called gravitational redshift. Makes sense. And this is what we were trying to observe. Now, when we first observed the star whipping around, it was 16 years ago, so it has a 16-year orbit. We didn't have the telescopes and the techniques that we could really measure this effect precisely. So we had to sort of wait. 
But turns out now in 2018, Nastara is back. It's now hurtling around um, in the fastest part of its orbit. Um, it was amazing. 7,600 kilometers per hour. Just extraordinary. It's insane. Yeah. I mean, as you said, a couple of percent of the speed of light. Yeah. And speed of light's the fastest thing we've got. That's really extraordinarily, extraordinarily fast. Yeah. yeah. So we're now at the perfect time to measure it again. And this is exactly what the gravity team have done. And they've been able to measure not only the speed of the star as it's going around, but also this gravitational redshift. And so when you do the calculations with Einstein's theory, his general theory of relativity, you actually go and do those calculations and you can see here's the result that you would expect if Newton was completely right. And then here are the corrections. I mean, even though this star is going incredibly fast, the corrections that relativity brings in are still quite small. And so you can say, well, here's, the, here's what we would expect if Newton was right. Here is the first correction. Here's the second correction. And you can compare the experimental observation with, all right, if it was a completely Keplerian, Newtonian orbit, it should be this. We see this. How close are they? And it is pretty much spot on to Einstein's theory, which comes as no huge surprise because Einstein's been right for 100 <laughs> years, but yep. we haven't ever done this particular kind of test before. Exactly. And, and this kind of extreme gravitational field is really exciting as yeah. well. Yeah. And so for Einstein fans everywhere, lots of flag waving, you know, hurrah for Albert, this is really cool. Um, for, you know, for those of us who are just merely science nerds, it's, it's such an amazing ability to be able to observe this over, you know, a couple of decades worth. And the really interesting thing about that film you were talking about, you're watching these stars going around in their orbit, is you can see over time the improvements to the observational techniques. Yeah. That at the beginning of the of the little animated GIF is the, is the style that I saw it. <laughs> at the beginning, you've got these quite hazy blobs, which are still obviously moving around some dark central point. But then suddenly it shifts and becomes much clearer and that's within the last decade, be getting much better telescopes with much better adaptive optics. That's something for a whole other podcast. <laughs> and suddenly it, it comes into almost sharp focus. It's just yeah, beautiful, yeah. absolutely beautiful. And gravity's been turned on since about 2016. That's They've gravity been... the study, not gravity the force. That's <laughs> yeah. been on forever. That's been on for a while. Yep. Yeah. Um, no, they've had this instrument on since 2016. So that, And you can see really the reduction in size of these objects and the precision, therefore, that you're able to measure these uh, things. It's, it's just incredible. It is beautiful. There's, You can see in some of the figures in the paper that they released that they were showing the position of this star, this S2, pretty much every day. As it's going around, you can see it shifting around. And the, the thought of, on a day-to-day -day basis, having a star in a different position in the night sky <laughs> and being able to measure that, that just blows my mind. And measure it from 26,000 light years away. Yeah, in the, in the heart of the brightest part of the galaxy, which is surrounded by dense clouds of dust and, and you know, nebulas and enormous numbers of stars. I just, you know, big thumbs up to astronomy. Well done. Yeah, yeah. It's brilliant when you get such a beautiful instrument like that and it just does exactly what you were hoping it to do. Okay, so enough with the pats on the back, though. You know, they've released this data. Einstein's right. Hurrah. And let's just be clear, it's not always a given that that's going to be the case. You know, there are still a lot of areas in, in physics, in astronomy, in astrophysics, in cosmology, where the general theory of relativity and our other theories about the way the universe works are a little bit question marky. And so doing a test like this, it's not an absolute you know, lay down Mazaire, that, that this is going to be spot on. And it would be really interesting if if Albert were proven to be not not 100 percent. That, that's an open door to say there's something else really interesting going on here. So there's that. But, you know, well done, Albert. Good work. 100 years on and we're still trying to find a hole in your theory. That's great. But we shouldn't rest on our laurels. So what happens from here for this research? Where do we go from here? So excitingly enough, so these were observations taken in May that we mm. were talking about. The um, the sort of path of the star as it goes around is is in its most interesting phase, if you like, up until September. Right, because this so, is where it's going right around closest to the supermassive black hole. It's going at its fastest. It's having the biggest 
relativistic effects yeah. before it goes out into the slower part of its journey and those effects become more and more negligible as it goes around. Yeah, and so we've got lots of opportunity to make more measurements and we're making them in two different ways as well, if you like. We're making the measurements in terms of how much their star is moving across the sky. So this is kind of like your um, astrometry or the position of the, the star in the sky. We're also measuring it in the other dimension as well so that we can build, reconstruct the two-dimensional velocity profile if you, of the star, which means we can tell where it's going exactly around the star through space. We're not just limited to, to a projection. So we're making both of those measurements simultaneously. So we really will be able to nail down this orbit. And there's some key points uh, in that orbit where some of those numbers are zero. Uh, for example, the, the star does doesn't appear to be moving towards or away from us for a short period of time. So there's lots of new measurements to be made over the next few months. I'm sure uh, people who are doing these are very, very excited. Um, so really, I mean, this is this is just the beginning. This is the first, first paper where they've said, OK, we've taken a really good hard look and everything's going really, really well. And we can, you know, if you follow these theoretical predictions and the and the experimental observations, then... Einstein's right and general relativity is really, really good, but there's so much more that we can extract from this to do more tests and to figure out exactly what this star is doing. Yeah, and we want to figure out what we want to do next time it comes around. Yeah. So one of the ideas... Because it's only going to be another 20 years? How yeah, 16 years. 16 years. Yeah. So uh, one of the things that general relativity predicts that we haven't seen yet is that the orbits of these stars should change over time because you're you're kind of losing energy and things like that. Um, now, I'm not really sure what the next two exactly mean, I can, I'll, but I'll tell you about them anyway because they sound really cool. So the light should go into circles. Okay. That sounds like a cool thing Interesting. to, to look Going to have into. to look that one up. Yep. And oh, this is really – this sounds awesome. This sounds like sci-fi. The space-time will rotate Ooh. with the black hole. Oh, yeah. Okay, I have heard of that, but I'm, we are delving into territory that I'm less and less comfortable with. But, of course, the black hole – isn't just sitting there. It would be very, very unusual to have, you know, black hole forms when when a lot of mass collapses down. And in the same way that when, you know, water goes down a plug hole, as it comes in towards the plug hole, it starts rotating faster and faster. You've got some angular momentum in there. You've got some rotation in there. When stuff collapses down, as a star collapses or as material falls into a black hole, it too will always have a bit of angular stuff, angular momentum. And that angular momentum still is is kept by the, by the black hole. It's one of its properties. And if that black hole is rotating, then the theories of relativity say, well, you know what, it's going to have a bit of a dragging effect on the space time around it in a kind of a similar-ish way to the water going down the plug hole. I don't know what that does, but it does something really interesting. Presumably, that sounds very cool. Presumably, if something's orbiting around it, then that orbit's going to get perturbed in interesting ways. And when you've got something which is millions of solar masses rotating around, that's going to have, presumably, a measurable impact on that star's orbit. That's cool. Yeah, yeah. So there's lots more to learn. And because I think we, ha we have such big questions in um, the universe, we don't know what what are we up to, like 95% of our universe actually is. We that don't, embarrassing little fact of, yeah. of cosmology. We don't know what dark matter is. We don't know what dark energy is. Both of those measurements require us to understand gravity really, really well. So we've got to be sure that the observations that we're making that infer both of these um, well, phenomena are as accurate as they can possibly be. And every time we go out and test GR, it seems to be that, we're, we're doing okay. Yeah. I mean, th this is this is one of the few, if if the only that I can think of, really high energy testing grounds for these kinds of theories. You know, general relativity is really important when you're looking at the orbit of Mercury, right? The closest planet to the sun is affected by the general relativistic perturbations, those tiny little effects of the sun's gravity at a relativistic way. You know, it really does have an impact. Um, the satellites going around the Earth that give us 
to within a couple of meters our position through GPS, those calculations have to take into account general relativistic effects, even just for a satellite going around the Earth. Yeah. I remember but, before we had those those um, corrections made for GR and, and GPS technology, and you had I was in a boat and we were sort of out there and it said that we were a kilometre away on top of the nearest hill when <laughs> really we were just, just puddling around in the harbour. Whereas, in fact, if you do make those corrections away from Newtonian physics to... Albert Einsteinian physics, then you can get it to, I mean, the military grade ones can get it down to like a meter, which is extraordinary. But being able to test them at a level of like very high energy, very high mass, there's there's very few ways that you can do that. We know that there are supermassive black holes at the center of other galaxies, but we can't see individual stars going around them. This is the only one we've got, as far as I know. Mm. That's really cool. Very cool. All right, it's time for us to exit this particular edition of Syzygy. If you've enjoyed the show, then we'd really love to hear from you. We'd love you to get in touch. There's a number of different ways that you can do that. You can go to our website, syzygy.fm. There's a form on there on the contact page. You can fill in your details and send us through your comments, your compliments, your concerns, your questions. We've had an entire episode based around a listener question before. Maybe we can do that for you as well if you've got a really good one. So send it through. But that's not the only way. There's social media as well. They can get in touch with us through Twitter. Yeah, at syzygypod. And we'll be keeping Twitter up to date over the next few weeks, which is very, very exciting because you don't wanted to miss you out on any any exciting astronomy news that's coming up no indeed i mean fomo is bad but astronomical fomo just <gasps> it's not it's not just doesn't even bear thinking about terrible stuff so there's twitter and of course facebook we uh, we throw stuff up there as well links to all of the episodes and other cool stuff that we come across so just go to facebook and as you do on facebook just search for us you know syzygy podcast you'll find us on there listen we're going to be taking a bit of a break uh we've got We're going to release this particular episode and then we're going into our summer break. I'm going to be taking a holiday. I'm going to Italy. Lucky me. And Emily is going away as well. But yours isn't a holiday so Um, much? One of them is actually a holiday. Next week I am going on holiday. Very nice. But you're going to be doing some work as well. Oh, it never stops, does it? Yeah. It's it's a tough (laughs) life being an astronomer. Where are you going this time? Um, Next week I'm going to France. We're going to go to the um, bottom end of the Loire Valley. Very nice. So, um, yeah, so do keep in touch with us through social media because that's the best way to find out when the next episode is released. That's right. That's right. And, you know, we put this plea out pretty much every week, but we're going to keep doing it because it is a really good way for us to get the word out. If you've enjoyed what you've listened to, then leave us a review. Send us your thoughts. Go to your podcast client of choice and tell us what you think. It's the best way that we've got to get the word out to other people who really enjoy the cosmos and the excitement they are in. So please do that. Help us out. Otherwise, we'll catch up with you in a few weeks' time. So it's bye from me. Goodbye. See you in a while.